something problems. Go ahead. Okay, thank you for uh, the invitation. So I'm gonna talk about, or the topic of my talk is uh, trace estimation, which I think will probably be familiar, at least to some people in the audience, but also there's an interesting story about dimension. So um, the idea comes from a setting where the dimension is exponentially large. And what I've done is kind of downgraded it to setting where it's only linearly large, but still perhaps large. Uh, so that's not maybe the usual uh, uh, pipeline of ideas. But anyways, in the lower dimensional setting, uh, certain improvements are possible. And that's the topic of the talk. So, okay. So trace estimation. Uh, suppose you can only perform matrix vector multiplications, um, <clears throat> which are called matvex by an n by n matrix. Uh, um, and you want to estimate the trace of this matrix. Then, uh, Basically, the most widely used generic approach uh, is arguably the, a randomized algorithm called the Hutchinson estimator. And I'm abusing the nomenclature a little bit because this is really a Hutchinson type estimator, um, which um, estimates the trace as the expected value of a qu this quadratic form uh, averaged over Gaussian random vectors. So there's a simple formula. So th this is an unbiased estimator and its variance, um, there's a simple formula for it. It's just the Frobenius norm of the matrix squared. And when M is positive semi-definite, the trace can be lower bounded by um, the Frobenius norm, which means that basically, well, literally the relative standard deviation of the Hutchinson estimator is, uh, less than equal to one. So it doesn't depend on the dimension at all. And it's hard to imagine you could ever do better. And you really can't. So why wouldn't you always use the Hutchinson estimator? Uh, well, in many scenarios, uh, you're really interested in computing some trace of the form trace A times M, where only M is positive semi-definite. And in this case, you can't really get any a priori control um, or not not satisfying control. Um, so the reason is that uh, this Frobenius norm of AM can grow faster than the trace uh, as in some high dimensional limit, uh, because in general, the off diagonal entries of AM are not controlled by the diagonal entries. And um, just for future reference, I'll comment that we may also be in, in fact interested in computing several of these traces at once for the same M, fixed M, but several different AK. Um, and the assumption is that you can multiply by these AK efficiently. So a major example uh, of interest is the problem of computing the diagonal of a matrix, a positive semi-definite matrix. And this can be viewed in the framework of the last slide by thinking of this is computing a bunch of uh, traces simultaneously, where um, the, these AKs are just the uh, just the indicator mat matrices along the diagonal. And in this case, um, if you just apply the Hutchinson estimator, you get this diagonal estimator, which is given by uh, taking the expected value of the entrywise product of the Gaussian random vector with the product MZ. So the circle product means entry-wise product. Um, so you can compute the variance for, of this estimator explicitly, and it turns out to be the just the norm. So, so the variance for the ith entry of the estimator is just the, the column norm of the matrix M. So the relative error will be large if basically the off-diagonal part of M is dominating the diagonal part. So it's very simple to understand when it would, would or wouldn't work well. So uh, in particular, if the matrix is very sparse uh, or look local in some sense, especially this is, you know, has a chance. Um, and in fact, if you know a sparsity pattern a priori, you can kind of de-randomize the Hutchinson estimator. And, um, this has been considered in this nice paper of Tang and Sot. Um, so 
there's kind of one other tool in your arsenal if you want to say compute the diagonal of a matrix that you only know how to multiply it by. And uh, that's to exploit low rankness. So if the matrix is low rank, uh, then, and you know the low rank factors, then everything can be done easily. You can explicitly compute the diagonal and um, that's fine. Um, so there's some hope that you can combine this then with a randomized bit that gets, if, if you're only approximately low rank, combine you know, the, using the low rankness with some randomized algorithm to sort of mop up the rest of the air. And that approach is called Hutch++, which is pretty famous now. Um, and uh, that will work in some settings, but there, there are a lot of matrices that are neither uh, low rank nor kind of, I'm saying diagonally predominant tongue in cheek, because it doesn't have to be diagonally dominant, but just that you don't have, uh, you know, that the, the off diagonal doesn't predominate in the matrix. Uh, so there's many matrices that satisfy neither of these criteria. And in fact, Hutch plus plus can be worse than Hutch if this if you split a matrix into a low rank piece plus another piece that somehow ruins this, where, where this second piece now has a ruined sparsity structure. So there's been some effort paid, you know, attention paid to trying to balance these considerations. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, you can't really combine these ideas on certain matrices of interest to get a constant variance estimator while still maintaining linear scaling of computation. So there's a lot of examples of trace estimation problems that fit into the framework that I just uh, set out. So uh, one is statistical leverage scores or Mahal and Obis distances which will come up later in an example. I'll just give a few examples later. Um, also, if you do Gaussian process regression and you want to um, get error bars for your uh, predicted function, you need to compute the diagonal of a matrix. Heat kernel signature, which is a sh shape descriptor used in graph analysis and computer graphics, can be viewed as the diagonal of something. Graphs and other, certain graph centrality scores can also be viewed as a diagonal. Uh, in electronic structure, there are certain eigensolver free approaches to density functional theory that uh, require one to estimate the diagonal of a matrix only known implicitly. And those are all diagonal uh, estimation problems. But um, also, if you're trying, if you have some problem where you try to optimize some objective involving log determinants and you need its gradient, um, that also has this kind of structure. So for example, when you're, if you're doing MLE or maximum a posteriori uh, uh, estimation uh, within um, a, a, a Gaussian process regression framework, then this will also come up. Um, and actually, I don't really have time to talk about it in the talk, but my motivation for doing this was uh, coming from semi-definite programming. So it turns out that um, if you can do this kind of estimation, then it suggests randomized algorithms for, for pretty generic semi-definite programs. So the inspiration comes from uh, quantum statistical mechanics, where um, uh, the inspiration for the, the idea of the talk, where you want to compute so-called thermal expectations uh, of the form in this equation. Um, and uh, here, um, the numerator is the kind of thing that we saw before, and the denominator is called the partition function. Um, so here, uh, e to the minus beta h, uh, well, that's a positive definite matrix. And h defines the physics of the problem. Um, I mean, it, there. We'll apply this to settings that are not physical at all, but just this is where the approach is coming from. And beta is an inverse temperature. Um, so uh, actually estimating Z in our setting just by Hutchinson is not the real problem. So if you can estimate this quotient, then you're happy. Um, and um, uh, there's a way to do this uh, that was introduced uh, in the 
quantum many body physics literature um, called minimally entangled typical thermal states algorithm introduced by Stoudemire and White. And um, yeah, so this is developed in a setting where the vectors are of exponentially large dimension. And um, the approach is specifically useful for um, uh, when applied within uh, an approximation framework that stores uh, vectors in a compressed tensor format, specifically matrix product states. And um, the original motivation for this whole algorithm, which, come, which is uh, featured in the, the phrase minimally entangled, actually has no bearing on today's talk whatsoever. So um, they came up with it for a very different reason. Um, that was kind of specific to this tensor approximation framework. Um, in, in our setting, um, we're going to assume that we can basically deal with vectors directly, but not the operators directly. So we don't ever want to form a full matrix, but forming a full vector is fine. So in this original inspirational setting, even forming a vector is not an option. Um, and um, so the point is then to introduce some improvements in this, uh, in some sense, easier setting and demonstrate um, broad applicability of the idea by combining with other numerical linear algebra tools. Okay, so what is METS? The basic idea of METS is to rewrite this trace um, in the numerator in the following way. So um, I can't see my own mouse, so I guess I'll just have to use words. I don't know if you can see it, uh, but it's not very helpful if I can't see it. So the, the trace is rewritten first by doing, so splitting up crucially the exponential into two, two, two halves, um, uh, the matrix square root of the exponential, then cyclically permuting and rewriting the trace as a sum over the diagonal elements, essentially. And then one defines this, um, handy vector, which is a unit vector, uh, which is just the normalized um, uh, vector proportional to e to the minus beta h over two times the ith standard basis vector. So that's appearing in the last expression in the first line. And if you rewrite the first equation uh, in terms of uh, this phi vector, you get the, the following, or the, this last equation that just appeared. And the important point is that you can view it as a statistical average over unit vectors, namely the phi's, that are drawn from a distribution p um, over the index i. And so in the red box, uh, that, um, uh, that uh, expression, you view it as the ith entry of a probability vector p. Uh, it's not negative and they sum over i up, up to one. So you can, you can think of this expression as, uh, as an expectation. And it's important that this quadratic form involving the phi, uh, well, within that, the, the phi is actually a unit vector now. Uh, it's not a vector of potentially arbitrary size, which it would have been if we somehow just uh, naively looked at the diagonal elements of the trace at the beginning to define the trace in the beginning. So I'll come back to why unit vectors are good, provided we can sample P. But in order to evaluate this uh, statistical average, then we're gonna wanna do it by sampling uh, from this probability vector. And, um, okay, so we need to sample P. And we can't form P fully because forming P fully, uh, as you can see in the last expression, it involves computing the diagonal of the matrix, which is exactly what we're trying to do in the first place. So, uh, okay, so we want to sample P and uh, we've kind of shifted all the difficulty there. Uh, so we can't build it explicitly. And this METS paper uh, introduced, in my opinion, a very ingenious idea, uh, which will generalize. And it's not really even clear to me what the precedent for it was, um, which is to define a Markov chain which has P as the invariant uh, distribution. Well, of course, that's not so ingenious um, 
you know, that's a classic approach to trying to sample from something that you can't uh, do sample from directly. But what's ingenious is the, the uh, very specific adapted cho uh, choice of Markov chain that just works for this example, uh, which is defined by the formula in the last line, where when you, uh, the transition probability from, uh, from uh, uh, the ith index to the jth index is just the square of, um, so, you, so you take phi of i, so you take that unit vector, and then you look at all of its um, entries squared, that forms, uh, those, those add up to one and you just pick one randomly according to those weights. So you actually kind of thinking of phi as a wave function and then doing a random measurement of the wave function, uh, if you're happy with that intuition. And um, okay, I'll explain why this works later in the more, in the other setting. So for now, that's just an inspired choice that happens to work. And uh, what it means is you can get samples by iterating uh, these steps. So you build a unit vector phi equals phi of i, and then you sample i, uh, the index according to the entries squared of phi. And you repeat uh, and you wait for that Markov chain to mix and you, your uh, sample i will be a sample from the prob probability vector p that we wanted and we can use that to estimate the trace. So there is a catch, which is exactly what we will address uh, to this approach, which is, um, uh, well, first I'll say what's good about it. So if uh, this matrix exponential is approximately rank one, which happens in the low temperature limit, then this will mix in one step. Uh, multiplying by that matrix or its square root will essentially project you onto the, um, whatever the, 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 the um, top singular vector is, and, and then it will never leave. So, uh, and that's what you want. But what happens that's unfortunate and which wasn't really the emphasis of this original work is when beta is large. Um, and in this case, the, the sampler very much gets stuck. So the mixing time becomes you know, arbitrarily long for this Markov chain. And that's because um, this matrix exponential is becoming very nearly diagonal. And so if you multiply a unit vector by a nearly diagonal matrix, well, you a standard vector, you get approximately the same standard vector back. And so you resample from the entries of that, you'll probably stay in the same place. So you'll, you tend to stay in the same place and not move around um, if the temperature is high. And uh, this is precisely when Hutchinson does a good job when the matrix is nearly diagonal. So we definitely want to, um, if, to be performing well in that regime uh, um, if we want a conclusive advantage. And in fact, we really want something that works uniformly well across all temperatures. So uh, there's some flexibility available to us that wasn't available in the original setting. And this is, uh, well, for reasons that will remain somewhat obscure, why it's unavailable in the original setting. But um, for us, it's simple to just, instead of using the trace formula in terms of the diagonal entries, we can use the trace formula as an expected value over a Gaussian random vector, just like in the Hutchinson estimator, but applied in a different way. And uh, we'll get an expression for this, the numerator of our thermal expectation. It looks very similar to the one from before, except instead of involving a sum over the index i, it involves an, uh, 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 an integral over the, uh, uh, the sort of Gaussian vector z. And uh, you get an, if you define an analogous unit vector phi, um, you get an analogous formula for the um, thermal average, where again, you are um, interpreting the thermal average as an expectation of a quadratic form, uh, 5z transpose a 5z. So, uh, so you're taking an expectation of that with respect to a, a probability distribution over the vector z, which is uh, the remaining part of that expression on the integral. Um, okay, so to recap, we rewrite the thermal expectation in the following way. 
where this probability distribution P of Z is now given by this formula, uh, which up to proportionality, you can rewrite uh, as I've done in the last expression. So we wanted a sample from this actually very simple looking formula where you take a Gaussian PDF and you multiply it by a quadratic form. And that's actually not uh, easy to do directly, even though it looks like maybe there should be some weird trick to do it. Um, so again, we'll define a markup chain, very analogous to the one before. So we want to sample from this probability distribution. And the principle here will explain also the earlier rule in a new way, which is that we want to sample from this P of Z, we introduce a essentially resolution of identity. So we sort of unwind a fake integration by some extra um, Gaussian random vector W, and then realize that um, this means that we can view the original P that we wanted to sample from as the marginal of a symmetric PDF given by the last expression, where F again is the Gaussian, standard Gaussian PDF. And then one can sample from this joint probability distribution of which we really want one marginal by Gibbs sampling. So alternatingly sampling from uh, P, Z given W and W given Z. But since it's a symmetric distribution, actually Gibbs sampling, we can really just uh, sample Z given our last Z and so on forever and kind of forget that uh, we're doing Gibbs sampling at all. So this is kind of a different interpretation of what was going on in the METS paper. Um, yeah, so although you can view it as a Gibbs sampler, you never really see the fact that you have two kind of marginals because it's symmetric. So the, the anyways, the, the problem reduces to sampling from this um, uh, conditional PDF given in the last expression, which uh, if you can then do, you can, uh, you can um, get an algorithm for estimating the trace by building a unit vector phi of z and then sampling your next z according to that uh, conditional probability distribution. And it turns out step two uh, can actually be done explicitly. So this conditional sampling can be done explicitly by a trick where you split z into parallel, so parts that are parallel and perpendicular to phi. Um, maybe I'll omit the details. So um, there's kind of an alternative useful perspective, which is to think of phi instead of z as the sampling variable. And then imagine that we're sampling from some density on the unit sphere. <clears throat> then when you do this, um, viewing phi as being sampled from some density q on the unit sphere, uh, you can rewrite the uh, k -th thermal expectation you're looking for in the following way as an expectation. More compactly, if you want many at once, we'll group them with a the bold notation. Um, and uh, the key point that's guaranteed by the fact that these phi's are unit vectors is that if you can draw samples, um, then this this natural estimator where you just um, yeah just the just the obvious choice of estimator uh, 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 given the expression on the last slide. Um, this has a variance that can be bounded very simply. So um, uh, uh, it's unbiased and uh, its variance can be controlled in terms of somehow these AK matrices. And in the case of diagonal estimation, this whole expression simplifies and you get a very simple bound on the, on the covariance. So in some sense, the, the difficulty of uh, the di diagonal estimation problem has been shifted entirely to the difficulty of, of actually sampling from this distribution. And once you can do it, once you can do, get samples, then the variance of your estimator will, will be controlled nicely. Um, okay, so um, before just getting into a couple of quick examples, I'll I have to just kind of explain one extra thing. So in the original algorithm, uh, METS, this Hamiltonian H is sort of the given object. But um, that happens in some settings to follow where you're given H and you want to compute the diagonal of E to the minus beta H, for example. 
And in that case, all we need to do to run the algorithm that I just described is to perform efficient matvex by a matrix exponential. So there's many approaches doing, you know, for doing this that only rely on the ability to multiply by h. For example, the one I just cited seem is uh, preferable in a lot of settings, but there are many others. And um, so that's uh, one kind of way this can be used. But oftentimes, uh, these trace estimation problems don't appear with the matrix exponential. For example, you often want to compute uh, thermal averages of the following form, where you're presented not m directly, but you're presented m as the inverse of a matrix k that's positive semi-definite, uh, for example, a, a kernel. And uh, well, you don't you don't need to take a logarithm of k inverse divided by two and re-exponentiate. You can just um, do all of that without dealing with matrix exponentials at all. Just direct all you need to be able to do is directly perform matvex by the square root of k inverse. Uh, so in other words, by k to the minus one half. And there are very beautiful approaches to doing this based on contour integration. The philosophy of which is that. Um, uh, to do a matvec by k to the minus one half, sorry, I put m here, but I meant k. Uh, it's not in some sense much harder than doing a linear solve by k. So um, it kind of reduces roughly to the complexity of, of solving linear systems in terms of k, uh, which is probably all you can hope for if k inverse is appearing in the problem in the first place. And there's a couple of extensions I mentioned briefly. So it is possible to exploit approximate low rankness in this framework in a way that doesn't damage the variance bound. So you can, it sort of does no harm to the method, uh, which compares favorably to Hutch plus plus. And also it's possible to apply this uh, in a setting where you factorize a positive definite matrix in a non-symmetric way. So our derivation considers the symmetric factorization into its matrix square root um, uh, but in fact, you could consider general uh, factorizations M equals BB transpose, as long as you uh, know how to multiply by B and B transpose. Um, okay, so I'll give a couple quick examples. So the first uh, is this thing I mentioned before called the heat kernel signature. So what this is, is that if you're given a graph, a graph, um, and you form its graph Laplacian L. Uh, if you take this matrix exponential of um, uh, minus TL, so you take E to the minus TL and look at the diagonal, uh, that thing, well, that's a vector which varies with time. Uh, it's a vector defined on the graph vertices which varies with time. That's called the heat kernel signature. So in fact, at small times, this kind of recovers a notion of scalar curvature even for graphs, but originally for Riemannian manifolds. And um, modulo some caveats, if you know the entire signature, then in principle, it determines the, the whole space up to isometry. Um, and um, consequently, uh, the heat kernel signature is used as a shape descriptor in computer graphics, but also uh, you know, where the graphs are triangle meshes, but also more generally in graph analysis. And up to my knowledge, there's no scaling, scalable algorithm for estimating it across all T. Uh, if you were to form this matrix exponential directly, the, the scaling would be cubic uh, in, the, in the graph size, which is not scalable really. And uh, it's not really suitable for either Hutchinson or a low rank estimator uh, because um, although the, this matrix exponential is approximately diagonal for small t, it, it's very much not so when t goes to infinity. And when, although it becomes low rank as t goes to infinity, uh, there's an intermediate regime where uh, it's neither local nor low rank. And so you need a new idea. And this thermal sampling approach works uniformly well across t, as I'll show. Uh, oh, I got my mouse back, okay. That would have been useful. For, okay, so this is a movie of the heat kernel signature on a graph as a function of time. And uh, on the left, what I'm showing is the uh, relative error um, computed by taking 10,000 samples for Hutchinson 
versus thermal sampling um, of the heat kernel signature uh, at various times. And so notably, this, these 10,000 samples are not effective samples. So they're not, they're not actually independent um, uh, uh, for the, uh, uh, the thermal sampling approach, they're just 10,000 samples taken after some burn in time, the Markov chain. And so an important upshot of that is that since the performance is, maintain, is uh, staying constantly good across time, an implication of that is that actually the mixing time of this Markov chain is uh, also independent of time. So it's, it's mixing uniformly fast across all temperatures from zero to infinity. Um, so that would be, the main concern of this approach, but it doesn't in practice, in practice somewhat miraculously, it seems not to be a concern at all. Here's just another example showing the same, uh, yeah, the exact same uh, kind of a result, but on a different um, triangle mesh. Uh, okay. And uh, the other quick example is, uh, uh, well, it's called the ridge leverage score. And what this is, is um, it's given by this matrix diagonal I've just written here. If you're given a matrix A, it's motivated for sketching, uh, matrix sketching applications in terms of A. So depending on the context, the rows could be, uh, you can think of them as corresponding either to samples or features. And uh, this lambda, the regret ridge parameter appearing uh, in the expression, uh, it's, to, it's somehow tuned to yield a rank K approximation. And uh, you need to take larger lambdas to get lower rank approximations, which conveniently makes this uh, matrix inside the inverse better condition. And um, uh, you could evaluate this diagonal directly with MK squared scaling, but you may actually want to avoid this. So, um, if K, even if K is far less than M, the K squared might still be something that's a nuisance. Um, and thermal sampling instead achieves uh, order MN uh, 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 scaling. So uh, the um, idea here is to split the matrix that we're trying to estimate the diagonal of into non-symmetric factors now. Uh, so this is a non-symmetric factorization example. And without really saying much about this example that I'm providing, it's just this fairly generic uh, toy problem. You can see the same kind of graph as before. So this is the performance um, over a range of ridge regression parameters, lambda. And you can see Hutchinson very much uh, depends on, uh, you know, the performance is very much lambda dependent and yet it, it's um, thermal sampling and in particular, the mixing time remain constantly good across all temperatures, or lambda, which is kind of like a temperature. Uh, so this is the reference for the talk, and um, thanks for your attention. Thank you, Michael. Are there some questions in the audience? Um, yes. I thank you very much for the nice talk. So I, I have a question mostly on the numeric. So you compare with Hutchinson. Did you try to compare also with low rank method? Uh, I'm wondering how large the sweet spot is because you said T small, yeah, so T large, other stuff works. So I'm wondering what's the range where yeah, so your method this, is much better. Let's just take this example, for example. So in this one, um, the matrix will become low, like approximately rank one when T goes to infinity. So low rank will become um, good in that regime. So in principle, you could imagine like starting with Hutchinson and then switching. I mean, maybe it's inelegant, but you might be happy with it. You know, switching when the rank gets small. But um, yeah, really like uh, it's not totally satisfying because um, uh, like uh, um, the basically the approximation quality of the low rank approximation for any fixed T will itself be um, N dependent. So 
uh, for any fixed T, if you want something that's kind of uh, scales linearly, um, the low rank, even using low rank approximation won't, won't work. And neither will combining the two, although I didn't show the result. But hopefully that answers the question. I see, thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. I was curious to you know, um, what do you mean by which notion of, of of optimality were you using for the sketching problem? Oh. Um, what does it mean here, optimal sampling? Yeah, so this is, uh, yeah, so well, of course it's some, somewhat context dependent, but like, um, um, I mean, basically say you want to, um, uh, so, so you want, you know, you have a matrix that's approximately low rank and you want to write it um, you know, you want to view it as a, it's column space as being approximately spanned by some subset of columns, which columns do you choose? For, for example, that would be the kind of motivating question here. Uh, for many matrices, you don't want to just choose a bunch of random columns. You actually want to favor certain columns over others, and you can use these ridge leverage scores to score, score them according to which ones ought to be sampled more. Um, uh, which ones ought to be sampled. Okay. And that was worked out in those papers by Musco and others. Well, there's two Muscos, uh, I think twins or brothers. Okay, thanks. Any last question? All right, sorry. Hi, thanks for your talk. Um, I have a question about something that you mentioned uh, regarding the um, um, use of uh, MPS for compression. Yeah. So um, I, I don't know if I understood it right. So the, the idea is that you, in order to construct the, the, the vectors phi that you need, you use this this uh, compression uh, scheme. Is this is this right or? Uh, so. Well, I don't think my slide is that informative, but I'll still come to it. Okay, yeah, so uh, in the original setting, um, uh, so the vectors themselves are too large to be stored. So they are represented as MPS. And otherwise you do everything exactly the same. So as long as you can do this kind of imaginary time evolution by H, in other words, multiplying by E to the minus beta H, of within the class of MPS tensors, then you can run this algorithm. You can't run the improved version, um, which requires these Gaussian random vectors, but you can run the original one. And that's, it, that, that's literally how it works. Right, thanks. And the H there would be an MPO. Uh, so it only requires you to be able to do imaginary time evolution of an MPS by Hamiltonian, which is an MPO. And that's kind of very standard within the um, uh, tensor network physics community. Okay, thank you very much, Michael, for the talk again. Recording stopped. <laughs>